Uh, so I hope you guys are all doing well and you can put up with me for the next two weeks. So uh, you should have me up until I think February 15th. I actually, I have to warn you, I've not been in the classroom since whatever it was, March 17th, that we went online because I've been on sabbatical. So uh, this is the first time I've actually taught for a while. So hopefully I'm not too rusty, but I have been doing this for a while, so it, it should pick back up. So I would like you, I think for today, you read uh, the causes and necessities of taking up arms in the declaration. For Wednesday, I would like you to read the Northwest Ordinance as well as the U.S. Constitution. That's a, a lot, obviously, uh, but I would like you to read through those. On the Northwest Ordinance, we'll go through these pretty specifically because they really define what it means to be a Republican, a small r Republican, not, not a member of a party, but one who believes in a republic, uh, especially the last part there where you have Articles 1 through 6. That's the most important part. The first part you can skim through pretty quickly, but make sure you really focus on Articles 1 through 6. That's what we'll focus on for our discussion at my lecture on Wednesday. Today, though, I want to start off by just looking at the Declaration, and we'll come back to the Declaration and Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms, but I want to look at the Declaration of Independence and try and break down what it means. So from what Anna told me, you had just finished Ben Franklin and the Enlightenment, and you've already done the First Great Awakening, right? So you have to keep those two ideals in mind that as we're getting to the founding, and we always begin the founding in February of 1761. I'll explain why in just a moment. But the founding always starts February 1761. And we could never understand it without first understanding that we've had this immense religious revival in the First Great Awakening, but that we've also had, to a lesser degree, the Enlightenment. Uh, and I say to a lesser degree, not that it was unimportant, it's very important, but the Enlightenment didn't influence people like you and me in, in a way that the religious revival did. So probably a majority of the American population was influenced in one way or another by the First Great Awakening, whereas the Enlightenment in the beginning only affected a few key figures, like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and Benjamin Rush. Those are really, whenever we think of the American Enlightenment, those are the three great figures that come to mind. And yet notice, we're not talking about a huge population. We're talking about just a very few people who are involved in this. So it'll become a bigger deal, especially when Thomas Jefferson becomes president. Then the Enlightenment will kind of go mainstream. But up until that point, it's just merely one stream of thought that goes into the revolution. What we have to remember about the American population at the time of the American Revolution is that it was incredibly decentralized in terms of where the population was. You had a few population centers like Boston, but most people live on the frontier. And that also means that the vast majority probably... 9 out of 10, if not 9.5 out of 10, were farmers. So that makes the revolution more complicated because farmers are generally not the type of people to go into open revolution. So that we've got to ask all of this. Why is it that the American population decides to revolt when it does and the way that it does? That it, this is one of the great mysteries of history, trying to figure out how this happens because everything you would say about a population that would revolt is not what you would say about the American population when it revolted. So it just doesn't fit most of the norms. Now, we've all, we've all lived through the last year. We've seen what a potential revolution can look like. We've seen what street violence looks like. That was all part of the American Revolution, but not to the extent it was that we saw over the last year, uh, meaning 2020, right? Not 2021, but 2020, and the kind of uprisings we saw. But that feeling of uneasiness would have been there. And that it's the first time in my life, I'm 53, it's the first time I've experienced uh, it. It was around in 1968, but I wasn't even one then, so I don't remember that very well. Uh, but this is the first time since 68 we've had anything like that. And really, it's amazing, regardless of what we thought about what happened over the year, it's amazing to get that kind of revolutionary feel. No other class I've ever taught before 
has felt that way before, that that's something that you and I now share, having seen at least a proto kind of revolution going on this summer. So, you know, for what it's worth, don't take that for granted that you got to see that. Don't forget it ever either. Um, I kind of hope we don't see it again, but that's, that's neither here nor there. We'll see what happens. So when we look to the declaration, and if we look on page 126, we have this opening statement here, which you were very nicely quoting just a moment ago. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> Actually, more than pretty impressive. That was extremely impressive. Uh, the, univer- the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. So even in that opening statement, we have something interesting. Right? They think of themselves as 13 United States. Right? So they don't focus on the United States. They think of them as 13 United States still very decentralized. And one of the themes we're going to see over the next couple of weeks is how Americans become more nationalistic and begin to unify. But that's going to take a while. And even when they're unified, they still always have this kind of, this this thing that prevents them from unifying too much. I mean, to this day, we still kind of have that in us, especially any of you who've been to Texas or some of the Great Plains states, you know how absolutely reluctant they are to give up what they believe in if they have to give it up for only the United States. If it's with the United States, it's one thing. But Texas, for example, just really does not like giving control to anyone else. Uh, And then you can say the same thing about Kansas and Nebraska. They're just not as loud about it as Texans are. Uh, But they feel it. South Dakota, they feel it, right, trying to do something different than what the country's doing. So we still have that kind of decentralized feel as a part of our culture. But we open up the declaration with this beautiful political statement, uh, this political philosophy statement. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. Now, that is utterly profound in all kinds of ways, but it's especially profound because the Americans feel like in some way they are tied to all of humanity, and they have to express to all of humanity what this means. This is not normal. People do not do this. The Bavarians, when they pass their beer laws, do not say we need to let humanity know what's going on here. This is not the kind of thing we see anywhere in the Western world or in the Eastern world. This is just not a part. uh, Now it is, but it wasn't prior to this. This declaration, right? We're going to let the world know what we're doing here. That's incredible that they would have the audacity to believe that anyone cares. And frankly, to have the audacity to have some assurance that someone will care is amazing in and of itself. And then, of course, they appeal not just to their own thoughts and feelings, but they appeal to the highest power possible, to nature and nature's God, right? which was a, a very 18th century way of saying God. So don't, don't get too hung about, uh, up with that uh, on the fact that it says nature and nature's God. That's, it's God. So we don't have to to stress too much about that. God is brought in three times in the Declaration of Independence. And it does have a deistic feel, but it's still God. And everybody who read this at the time knew what they were talking about. But that's more philosophical language in the way they're using it. But notice how this breaks down. We're given a cosmological statement at the very beginning. This is what we, as these 13 diverse peoples, believe unifies us. And we are unified by our belief in nature and nature's God. So there is a law that is higher than any one of us. And we're trying to figure out what that law is. So the Declaration, if you've had a chance to read through it, the Declaration is really broken down into two parts. The first part, which is the famous part that we have all heard a million times in our life, I'm sure most of us have heard it as many times as we've heard the Lord's Prayer. This beginning, when in the course of human events, and we hold these truths to be self-evident. It makes up about a fifth, even though it's what we all focus on, that makes up about one-fifth of the document. 
But the rest of the document is really important as well because the rest of the document is the proof, the evidence. So we give you a philosophical statement, this is what we believe, but then we say exactly why, what has happened. And it's interesting to look through these because every grievance, so if you start there on line 29 on page 126, we have the kind of opening statement to the grievances. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So I, I know we don't know each other yet, but let me throw this out to you. What do they mean by the public good? What do you think that would mean? And feel free to be obvious. Yeah. Just the general welfare of the colonies okay. of England. What's your name? I'm, I'm Hope. Hope. Thank you. Yeah, so the general welfare, right? That's another way of putting it. What, what's another way? Public good, common good, public welfare, general welfare. What else? What kind of government are they trying to create? Yeah. Not necessarily a democracy, but more democratized compared to the monarch. Okay, and what do we generally call what they're trying to create? A republic. A republic. What's your name? Paul. Paul. All right, so let's break that word down for a moment. So you take the word republic, and in Latin, it's race, two words, race publica. And we bring it back together, is republic. And what it means, and you can see it right there, the public good, the common good, the good thing, are different ways. And even to this day, for example, Iceland, which also is a republic, its parliament is called the thing, which I always love, just T-H-I-N-G, the thing, because that's the public thing. That's the public good right there. And Congress, to Congress is to bring the public good together. So we also, we can call it a commonwealth. It's the same kind of thing, right? a commonwealth. This is not a private wealth. There is not some president or king who owns everything. Instead, we share it. It is the republic. And so this idea right away is, and notice what they've done, 13 colonies, one universe, and by the way, this is how this ties us to humanity, we're working for the good of everyone. So it's everyone is involved in this. And that, again, that's outrageous that they're that audacious, that they think they can get away with that. It's incredible. It's just mind-boggling that they could do that. But they want to do that. And so right away, what happens? Well, it's not enough for us to give our philosophical statement. We have to prove our case. So imagine we're in a court of law, but now we're in the court of nations. We have to prove our case. And that's exactly what they do. Uh, what do we have? Well, right away, there's no representation. If you look at those first, actually, four or five grievances, there's no re representation that we're being allowed. So you're not allowing us to speak for ourselves. That's ridiculous. And then after that, look at line 10 on page 127. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. Where's our market? We believe in a free market, but you're not allowing us to settle land. You're not allowing us to do what is natural to us, and therefore you're in violation of, of everything. Then you get down to line 15, and we see problems in the judiciary. So here we have problems with the judicial branch. You're not allowing us to have courts in the way that we should have courts. And then one of my favorites, line 19 and 20, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms, right, swarms of officers. We would say bureaucrats. Right? He has sent swarms of bureaucrats to ha harass our people and eat out our substance. And then one that I think is probably a little shocking to most of us, especially we're at Hillsdale, we love the military, but the founders were deeply, deeply concerned about a standing army. Standing Navy is one thing, but a standing army is something else. And so do we see there 
What is that line? I've got too many marks in my book. Line 21 and 22. He has kept among us in time of peace a standing army without the consent of our legislature. I have great threat. What do you need that standing army for? So there were serious problems here. And then we just keep going and we have more questions about the military and about the Indians and how they play a role within our society. But overall, just keep in mind, all of these are violations of what we call the common law. Right? They're all violations of the common law. So let me try and explain what that means. And if Anna has gone over any of this with you already, don't hesitate to stop me. I don't want to talk about the idea of a common law. Okay, anybody, anybody know what this is? Have you guys talked about it at all? Some of you may remember from Western Heritage. What's the common law mean? I mean it's most obvious level. It's obvious it apply, applies to all of us. Right. Yeah. What's your name? Gabe. Gabe? Yes. Thanks. Um, common law is the collection of judicial practices or regulations yep. commonly held by people. Like um, the most obvious example is Britain, where they just had a tradition of this is the way the laws work. And that tradition, the tradition of how things worked, um, built up the strength of, had the eh, word for law, veracity. Um, I need a thesaurus at this moment. Oh, like, yes. Right. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. No, that's great, Gabe. Okay, good. So let, let's talk about this for a moment, this idea of common law. So common law is in, it becomes common law in the English-speaking tradition, but we find it not just in the English-speaking tradition. Common law is actually throughout all the Germanic tribes. So Scandinavians still have it. Uh, the Danes still use common law, for example. Uh, the English do, but not as much as they used to. Common law is this... It's weird, but it's really cool. Uh, common law is the idea that our law, as we understand it, emerges spontaneously from the conflicts that we would have with one another. So if Gabe and I suddenly find that we're violating each other's property rights, we take it to you and you decide what the precedent is. That is, does Gabe win or do I win And based on what rule? That precedent then becomes the rule for the next time there's a problem. And that means that you can have precedents going back quite literally thousands of years, depending on if they're recorded and if they're remembered. But much like what we just saw with the Declaration, where you have 13 people, one universe, a common humanity, the same thing is true with common law. Common law sounds like it's very particular because Gabe and I just had a conflict and we resolved it. But it's rooted in nature itself. And so there are always principles in the common law that can never, ever be overridden. So as Americans, we have these advantages. We can never, ever be presumed guilty. We must always be presumed innocent. Right? That's one of the, the most fundamental rules of law, that we are innocent until proven guilty. Now that's totally, if you're in Austria and the police arrest you, they don't sit there and think, oh, we just wasted our time because this person is innocent. <laughs> Their whole system is based on the fact that if they catch you doing something, the burden of proof is now on you to show that you're not guilty. That's very different than what we have, where the courts, the administration, everything has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. If there's even a doubt that you're not guilty, they have to let you off. Right? It doesn't always work that way, of course, but what the ideal is. So to be innocent until proven guilty, what else do we have as Americans? What are we guaranteed if we go to a trial? If it's a, yeah. a speedy and public trial? A speedy and public trial, and there's one more thing that goes with that. Um, what am by, I getting? By our peers. By our peers, right? What's your name? Uh, Tom. Tom, thank you. So by our peers. Well, how do we do that? We pick 12 people. And that means that we don't pick 12 people if we have a case here in Hillsdale. We don't pick them from Illinois. We don't pick them from California. They're from our community. And you're meant to know each other in a trial. 
You're not meant to be completely isolated from one another. It is a trial by your peers. And what can a jury do? Anyone in here been on a jury trial? I got called once, but it got canceled, so I've never been. But when you're on a jury, you can rule anything. You can say that the person's innocent. If you only have that one smidgen of doubt, even if all the evidence except for one little thing adds up to his guilt, you can let him off. Can you imagine what kind of power that is? That's incredible power. But you, for all intents and purposes, a jury can suspend time and space for a moment. Not long, but a moment. And then what happens to that jury? Does it ever meet again? Never. It's a one-time deal. <laughs> That's, who in their right mind would have thought of that? What rational person sits down and says, Hmm, well, we'll make sure everyone's innocent because, you know, that, that's really important. Oh, and we're going to make sure that we have 12 people from the community. Well, you might think Jesus had 12 disciples, but we actually know the jury trial is older than Christianity. So that doesn't work. Maybe the 12 astrological signs, and that's kind of creepy, but you know, <laughs> that could be it. But we don't know. But no rational person would have sat down. So here's the, I'll get you in one second. I mean, here's the thing about this. I could never, even if I spent my entire career studying juries, I could never tell you the origin of the institution of the jury. Part of common law is a belief that it just exists. That's it. It's a faith. That thing exists. And in fact, if I ever could say, oh, well, King Alfred made the jury, well, then it's man-made. Now, by not saying who made it, it has this aura of mystery about it. Same thing, there's an aura of mystery at the beginning of the Declaration. It's a common law document. Does that make sense for everyone? You see where common law, why that's so important to this. So every one of those grievances is a violation of the common law that we see in the Declaration. Every single one of them, mm -hmm. in some way, is a violation of the common law. Okay, I'm sorry, you've had your hand up for a bit. Yeah, so... Yeah. Tell me so, your name. Oh, I'm Spencer. Spencer. Yeah. So um, in high school, I acted in the play 12 Angry Men. Yeah, good. Which involves um, this jury of 12 people where only one of them thinks he's innocent. Absolutely. And you need a unanimous, you need everyone to be unanimous on their decision or else it's a hung jury. And um, this one man is able to convince the other 11 eventually that this kid is innocent. It's a great, it's a great story. Right, and there, there's the power of that. There's the power of innocence, but the power of the jury as well. It's also a, a very good movie with, oh, I can't remember. The, yes, thank you, yes. So we're seeing at some point. Yeah, good. So great great way to look at the common law, absolutely. Okay, so does that make sense for everyone? If, if for example, Anna gives you a midterm and she puts up the term republic or common law, I feel like, at least get an idea of that. So I'm going to talk more about a republic, but for now, we'll keep it there. Okay, so let me give you two dates. Both are very important for the founding. The first one is February 1761. And it involves a man whom we should all know, but we've kind of forgotten him. A guy by the name of James Otis, who was a lawyer. And James Otis is a common lawyer, meaning he's a lawyer of the common law. That's his specialty. And most Americans believe in the common law. Uh, it's just, it's a part of our DNA to believe in that. And interestingly enough, uh, we can get into this more, uh, maybe not today, but if you want, sometime in the next two weeks. But interestingly enough, slavery is illegal in the common law. So you can't, you can't have a commons and have a group of people enslaved. It doesn't work at all. It's one reason that through the history of slavery, slaves and runaway slaves are always trying to make it into a common law because by actually making it physically into the common law, they're freed. It's a, it's a huge, for Southerners, it's a huge problem, uh, but it's a, obviously a, a great boon as well. So we can get into that, but I just, I want you to recognize that power of what that law is. But it works in other ways as well. The British don't like the common law on American soil because they can't get their way with us if we have a common law. There are too many things preventing them from governing, governing us in a way that they want to govern us. And they're, they're an empire. They want to govern us. 
And one of the things that they pass during the French and Indian War, which if you guys remember the French and Indian War, uh, I don't know if you've talked about it, but it would have been from in America about 1753 up until about 1763. It's also called the Seven Years' War. Obviously, it's a little bit longer than seven years, so some of these names are a little goofy. But during that war, the British passed what were called writs, meaning a written document, a writ of assistance. And the writ of assistance was a warrant. So if I were a police officer and I had a writ of assistance, I could come up to your property and search it. But common law had very specific things it said about what a police officer could and couldn't search. So tell me your name again. Paul. So if I suspect that Paul, and I guess now my, my examples are too old, because I was going to say, let's say you had some marijuana or something in your, <laughs> but now that's legal in Michigan, right? So, uh, well, we're going to consider it illegal for a moment, just for the sake of argument. So let's say that I suspect that Paul has marijuana, and an illegal substance. Well, under a writ of assistance, all I have to do is show up at his house and start searching. But under common law, the jury and the, the opinion had developed that the only way an officer could come was to give you warning, so Paul would be warned that there was going to be a search of his property. And it couldn't just be a search of any part of his property. I would have to say, it, say and it's like if you guys have ever played Clue, I suspect that the marijuana is in the bottom of the closet in the upper room on the right side of the house. And if I walked in and it was in the upper room on the left side of the house, the warrant is invalid because I'm, I'm messed up. And so in other words, I hope we can all see what this is doing. You're not supposed to have searches and seizures. Hey, the cops are not supposed to be searching your property. Right? That's the whole point of common law. It's your property. And they don't have the right to do that. But Britain passed these laws. Well, if I took this law into a common law court, what would happen? If I took a writ of assistance into a common law court, what would the judge do immediately? It. Yeah, you can't, these are two different types of law, right? You can't do that. So the British had to create new forms of law courts and they created what were called admiralty courts, meaning naval, but on land. So the kinds of things you could do on a naval ship, which you can get away with a lot more on a naval ship because it's regimented. You can do, I, I can search anyone's quarters. I'm captain. I can do what I want. I can marry people. I can do anything. I, I'm, I'm the king of this ship. Right? So they transfer admiralty law onto land. And they start allowing these searches, these searches and seizures of huge things that are in violation of the common law. Well, here's what happens. James Otis is this really great orator, kind of crazy, a little bit, I mean, he's kind of the town crank, a little bit odd, but Otis is absolutely a common lawyer, and he refuses to buy into this idea of these admiralty courts having any jurisdiction on American soil. And remember, for those of you who read the Declaration, you know that the British have imposed all kinds of courts upon us. Right? That's what they're doing. They're imposing their own form of courts that violate our form of law. And so James Otis takes a case in the Admiralty Court, but he takes the side of the common law, and he ends up giving this four-hour oration to three judges. So Admiralty Courts had three judges, not one, but three. And he gives this four-hour speech, and word goes throughout all of Boston guess what old man Otis is doing? He's going crazy. He's given an amazing oration, spontaneous, down at the courthouse. Well, Bostonians from all over the city flood into the courthouse because they want to see Otis give this speech. And what does Otis say? He says, first time on American soil, as far as we know, we believe in life, liberty, and property. That's his oration for four hours. We believe in life, liberty, and property. And by the way, there can never be taxation without representation. Right? Two very famous phrases 
that come out of Otis's speech. And there are two people in the court who really, really matter. One is a brewer by the name of Sam Adams, and the other is his cousin, a young, very poor lawyer by the name of John Adams. And John Adams says, the revolution was born right then, at the moment that James Otis declared the common law and life, liberty, and property. At that moment, the revolution began. So we're not going to have fighting yet, none of that, but that's going to be an important part of this. So that's the first date, very beginning of the revolution, February of 1761. And then we'll go to the very beginning of the actual violent revolution. Second date, I want you to know. And that second date is actually two dates, but in one. It's kind of an overnight. April 18 through 19, 1775. And it involves a town, a very small town, called Lexington. And Lexington is about 20 miles outside of Boston, maybe a little less, but it's outside of Boston. So Boston is not just a major city, it is, along with Philadelphia, one of the two largest cities in America, bigger than New York at this point. Boston, if you take the road west, you hit Lexington, little town, and it, from Lexington, you can go one of two directions. You can either go up to New Hampshire, or you can go on to a city that is well known for its revolutionary fervor called Concord, home of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Later, they're not alive yet. Later, but there they are. Okay, so Lexington is this little crossroads, and I have to kind of explain the way it's laid out. Hey, anybody in here been to Lexington Green? You have? That's great. It is well worth going. It's one of the neatest spots in America, in my opinion. Um, some of you guys, I know a lot of you were sophomores. You may know my daughter, Gretchen Berzer. So she, uh, I took her when she was very little and all my kids. And I still remember this is one of the great moments of my life. But when you get to the green, the green is, is not what we think of in a lot of ways. Usually a village green we think of as being this kind of rectangle in the middle of town. This is a triangle because of the way the road is. And it's pretty good size. So if I were to stand right here where the three roads meet and I looked, uh, I looked across campus, I would be looking probably in the Dow parking lot. That's how far it is, if that gives you a sense of, say, from here to maybe here. That's how, so it's, it's a big green. Don't think of it as just a little park. It's a pretty big green. And on that green, you have a couple of places that are really important. Right here, on the corner, you have the city tavern. So this is the pub, right? Everybody meets. Interesting, guys, I mean, this is just a trivial point, but pub, a publican, it's where the term pub comes from, from someone who is a Republican, right? It means you're the center of the town. So, I don't know how we'll designate this. I'll make this a little beer mug. You guys can see it's not that much more like a coffee mug, but anyway, uh, we'll call that a beer mug. And next to the tavern is the minister's house. And across the street from the tavern is the church. Everything you need right there. You got your, you got your beer and you got your religion. Everything right there. Okay, the pastor's name, and I do want you guys to know this. The pastor's name is a man called Jonas Clark. And he is only the third pastor in this town. They've passed it on. So you have one pastor, new pastor. He's the third pastor, Jonas Clark. And I know that you studied with Anna. You studied Winthrop, right? And you looked at the New England. So this is a New England town. This is absolutely a New England town. It's Calvinist, very serious about its Calvinism. It takes its faith very, very seriously. And it means that someone like Jonas Clark is really the head person of the town. He is the leader of the town. He is the great intellect. In his house, which is rather good size, he also has a library, one of only about 10 libraries in America at this time. 
and he loans books all the time. You want to re- come get a book from Pastor Clark? All he requires is that after you've read it, you come have tea with him and talk about the book when you return it. Right? That's That was the rule. And people came from all over to his library. and That, that was true of the basically 10 libraries that existed throughout colonial America. So people are coming all the time to these places. Everybody knows Clark. He's well known throughout the whole 13 colonies. Clark had gotten very interested in not just Calvinist theology, because he was a Calvinist, but he'd gotten very interested in the idea of what is man, that is, what is the human person, within a religious understanding So when we read the Declaration of Independence, even though it's Thomas Jefferson who wrote that, it could have been Jonas Clark for the previous probably 10 years prior to this moment. He had been thinking about this, giving sermons all the time. What is the role of man in a fallen world? What is the role of man within theology? What is the role of man within society? And his argument was a traditional American understanding Man is created uniquely in the image of God to defend and fight for what is uniquely his. So, a man defends what is his own. Well, you probably know part of this story. On April 18th, Paul Revere comes riding in and saying, one if by land, two if by sea, as far as we know, you've got about 6,600 British troops heading your way. The British, in the spring of 1775, had decided that they were going to go to Concord and capture Concord, basically lay siege to it, and arrest all of the political figures there. Lexington just happens to be on the way. But imagine that. You've got this little town. 6,600 British troops are moving your direction. And Revere tells, I mean, he knocks on the door a few minutes before midnight, And he tells Jonas Clark, who also happens to be hosting Sam Adams there, and John Hancock, they're all up late talking to one another. He says, you've got to get out of here. These troops are coming. I don't know what you're going to do, but be warned. You've got these troops coming. Well, what is Clark's response? It's almost midnight, April 18th. He goes out and he rings the church bells. Everybody in town comes out. Now, just imagine this, this little New England town. Every person, every citizen of the town comes out and Clark tells them, you know what I think? We should fight, but we only have a small militia. In fact, they can only get 42 men together for their militia against 6,600. Like We need to fight, but how do we do that? I don't know. We need to talk about this. So you've got the entire community is debating this from midnight until about four in the morning. They're in the pub, they're in the church, they're on the village green, there are kids up. This is a whole community, and they're trying to decide what they're going to do. And right before the British troops arrive, they decide two things. Number one, they're going to stand in parade formation as far away as possible from the British troops. British are going to be coming from Boston, and the chances are not good they're going to go up to New Hampshire. They're going to be going towards Concord. So that means they're going to take this road. And if we're standing here, there should be no direct confrontation with the British troops. Does that make sense for you guys to visualize this? There shouldn't be any direct confrontation. What they do is the 42 militia line up in parade formation as a way of demonstrating that they are a militia, but they are not a threat at all to the British. And of course, they're so greatly outnumbered chances are good that they wouldn't be seen as a threat. The second thing they decide, and I always love this, this would not happen in my church. My church is way too pacifistic for things like this. But there was a guy who was in the attic of the church because that's where they stole all their, uh, stored all their gunpowder. And he stood there with an open match that if the British took one foot into the church, he was going to blow it up. <laughs> These guys were dedicated, right? It's like really, really dedicated. So soldiers come in, and they see all the way across. It's dark at night. They see all the way across the village green, these 42 men standing there in parade formation. And the lead British officer is unbelievably arrogant. 
And he takes his men with him, and they march across, across the green, and they tell the Americans, now Americans, or they will be Americans in a minute, right? he tells these citizens of Lexington, this is an illegal demonstration, you must break up immediately. Now, he could have gone on, I mean, anything, this was not a real threat, but he is arrogant enough to believe that he has the right to do this. And the men, the Lexington men, are so shocked, they actually start putting down their weapons. And suddenly a shot is fired. We have no idea, to this day, we have no idea who fired the first shot. We don't know if a British soldier did, which is probably unlikely because they were probably fairly well trained. Uh, It could have been a a militia man, or it could have been someone in the pub, but someone right there fired a shot. And then the British just very coolly lowered their guns and opened fire into the Americans. And 10 Americans died very, very quickly. But I hope you even caught my language. They are Americans now. That's the beginning. I, this is the moment when it all changes because of what happens here at Lexington Green. Because once you have the sacrifice of civilians, even though they're militia, this means essentially open war. And that's the first shot fired in the American Revolution. So let's go back and think about these words. All right, Does somebody want to read where we hold these truths to be self evident? Is it no, not Tom? Yeah. Yeah, Tom. Do you mind? For sure. Thank you. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be challenged for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. All right, thanks, Tom. So please notice here, and what I'm trying to get at with the examples we have on the board It took 15 years, 14 years, right, for this movement to really blossom. Nobody's fighting in the courtroom with James Otis in February of 1761, and yet by his very words, he's indicating that the Americans are thinking about things in a fashion different from the British, and they're acting in a fashion different from the British. The common law matters to the Americans. Admiralty law, the law law of power and abuse, is what the British are trying to do. And so it's going to take a good 14, 15 years before there's actually open violence. And notice, what's the date of the Declaration? We all know, right? How long is it after Lexington? A full year. year, So even after fighting has started... I mean, actual fighting and bloodletting. Even after that, it takes the Americans another year to actually make this real. So that is a lot of patience. A lot of patience. And that's one thing I think we we sometimes miss because we think of revolution and we think of heated tempers and we think about immediate action. But it took a while for these things to come through. And that's part of what we see here, that there is this kind of sufferance that the Americans are dealing with, this kind of uh, suffering that the Americans are dealing with. 
and trying to get the British to back down. And the British just won't do it. So you even have, and we didn't go over it, but you even have the causes and necessities of taking up arms, right, which was written within about two months, three months after Lexington. And we have an example there. Well, this is our last appeal. Right? Our last appeal is to the reason of arms. And so you forced us into this position. It's not what we wanted, but you forced us into it. And that train of abuses has been going on now for those 15 years. And the Americans finally, once, once this first shot is fired, they finally say, you know, enough is enough. We're not going to take this anymore. Uh, we can't take it anymore. To take it anymore would be a violation of our understanding of who we are as men and women. And we can't do that. Okay, any, any final questions? about any of this. Any questions at all? I thought, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> okay, well, we can end uh, a minute or two early. So thanks, everyone, for being patient with me. A little rusty, but we'll get back into it. So I'll see you guys all on Wednesday. And just make sure that you've read the Constitution and the Northwest Ordinance. We're going we're gonna to define a republic.